Hi, everyone. I think we'll get started. We haven't done a, you know, a hybrid or in-person rounds in quite a while, so I forgot the quieting of the room moment. Um, so this is hybrid. We have a lot of people online, and uh, we actually have quite a few people in the room, too, so this is great. Um, and uh, it's obviously a special day. It's uh, the Peter Humphreys Neurology Day, and it's really to celebrate research in neurology, and especially research by residents. And we have a, uh, a special guest speaker today as well. Um, so uh, Dr. Doja is going to invite our speaker or introduce our speaker, uh, also invited. Um, but uh, I wanted to briefly acknowledge the day and also acknowledge Peter, who's with us here today. Uh, and, uh, you know, I realize I kind of grew up with Peter as a role model, um, you know, someone you aspire to be like and probably never were going to quite be like. Um, and extremely respected internationally and really around Canada. Uh, you say Peter's name anywhere and, uh, you know, immediately the um, uh, immediate understanding of the respected clinician and clinician scientist and investigator um, uh, was immediately understood by anyone in the pediatric community. And this isn't a eulogy. This is true. You know, anywhere I went, uh, you know, that was the uh, reaction whenever Peter came up in conversation because either something he taught or something he did or something he was going to do. Um, so I um, I have a, a bio for Peter. I'm going to quickly read through it because it's, as I was just reflecting, it's already abbreviated and it's all true and it's somewhat long. So I didn't want to take too much from the session. Um, and then at the end, I'll just get Peter to come and uh, uh, wave to the people online uh, mm -hmm. so that they can see him too. So Peter, as I said, is one of the most respected pediatric neurologists in Canada. His professionalism, humility, dedication to teaching and compassion for his patients make him, uh, make him an exemplary role model for all pediatric neurologists. He graduated from medical school at McGill University in 1966, receiving the Holmes Gold Medal for Excellence. He trained in pediatrics at Boston Children's, Harvard University, and St. Mary's Hospital in London. He completed his neurology training at the MNI, in 1973, I was born at the Jewish in 1970, kind of down the road. So uh, it gives you that kind of length and depth of his career. Uh, before joining uh, Montreal Children's Hospital as staff from 1973 to 79, he then founded the Division of Neurology at CHEO in 1979 as the sole neurologist and one of the founding members of CHEO. He has trained numerous neurologists and continues to train post-retirement um, he was just mentioning that he's still doing weekly neuroanatomy sessions with uh, a pediatric uh, neurology residents. Um, and, uh, you know, he was the perfect example of a professor when he conducted bedside neurology professor rounds. His dedication to teaching is reinforced by the publication of his textbook, The Integrated Nervous System, a Systematic Diagnostic Approach. His lifelong learning philosophy lives on through the annual Peter Humphreys Neurosciences Day at CHEO. So that's why we're here today. Uh, uh, yeah, I got to finish this. Clinically, Dr. Humphreys truly believed in family and patient-centered care and delivered care in a thoughtful and professional manner. His passion for clinical excellence and recognition of an unmet need led to the establishment of the Rett Syndrome Clinic at CHEO, seeing patients from childhood to adulthood. This has led to multiple contrib contributions to the Rett syndrome world, both from an advocacy and research perspective. As recognition of his work, he received an award of merit from the Ontario Rett syndrome association in 2010. Aside from teaching and clinical excellence, Peter's love for research was evident by his numerous clinical and basic science publications in the fields of Rett syndrome and cortical malformations. Most importantly, one cannot forget his role, both as a loving and supporting husband and father to his, uh, his children. Dr. Humphreys has been a mentor and role model to all who have crossed his path. And this was the write-up when he was awarded the 2021 CACN Henry Dunn Lifetime Achievement Award. So again, I don't think I could have taken anything out of that. Uh, we're here to recognize Peter and all the work he's done and also look to the future with the work that is being done now and coming. So Peter, if I could get you to just come and say hi to everyone online. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I can see your names. It's my pleasure to be here. I look forward to hearing Dr. Fox. Thank you.
So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know me, I think most people do. Asif Doja, I'm the division head of neurology. Just want to thank uh, Dr. Chakraborty for that introduction and thank uh, Dr. Humphreys for being here in person. And I'm going to introduce our speaker. Just a few housekeeping things so people know what the day uh, will uh, uh, consist of. We're going to have uh, our, our Grand Rounds lecture uh, from Dr. Class. We'll have a break after that. Then we will do some training pre uh, presentations. Uh, till about noon or so. Uh, those will also be via Zoom, so if people want to join in for those. And then in the afternoon, this is mainly for trainees, not just in uh, uh, neonatology and neurology, but all trainees at Chio are invited to hear some interesting cases uh, that we're going to present to Dr. Glass and have a discussion about those in the afternoon. We'll wrap up by about 2.45 or so. Um, so it, it, and then I'll do the questions at the end of Dr. Glass's presentation. Um, we'll probably open up to the floor first in person, and then 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 we we'll, can do the virtual as well. I'll, I'll figure out. How to do it. it is my extreme pleasure to welcome Dr. Glass here today. Uh, Dr. Glass is a friend and colleague who I've known for probably twenty plus years. Um, and uh, Dr. Glass, she is currently uh, in San Francisco, but she is Canadian uh, from Montreal originally, trained in Calgary, and then did a neonatal neurology uh, fellowship. Uh, at UCSF. So she's currently a professor of neurology, pediatrics, epidemiology, and biostatistics at the University of California in San Francisco. She's a neonatal neurologist and a founding co-director of the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Neurointensive Care Nursery and the director of neonatal critical care services at uh, UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. She's also the program director of the neonatal fellowship program, which is one of the most renowned, if not the most renowned uh, in North America. Uh, Dr. Glass specializes in brain-focused care for children and neuro, uh, with neurological conditions diagnosed in the newborn period, including HIE, stroke, and seizures. Today, uh, Dr. Glass is going to be speaking about neonatal seizures. She is a world expert, if not the world expert on neonatal seizures. So I'm very pleased to welcome, as I mentioned, my colleague and friend, Dr. Glass here today. Great, thank you so much, Asif. Um, really a pleasure to be here, to be back in Canada. I was saying, I, I think it might have been um, Royal College exams might have been the last time I was in Ottawa. So I don't get here um, as often as I'd like. Let's see if we can display. I also recognize I'm like a little short to see over the computer here, but I'm told I need to be in front of the, uh, in front of the camera. We're good. Okay, you can see me. Um, well, so today I thought I was going to talk about um, bridging research to practice and talk a little bit about latest evidence and guidelines for neonatal seizure management. And, and this is a, like a really exciting topic for me because I'm at the point in my career where some of the earlier work and some of the um, work that I've been doing is now seeing its way in into guidelines. So um, for the junior people in the crowd who are just embarking on research careers, hopefully this is um, a call to action and um, a way to get excited. Yep, so tell me. Yeah. Not sharing. Here, you go ahead. And... Great, you haven't you haven't missed anything yet. Oh yeah. We move it a little bit further. Okay. All right. So our objectives today. Um, we'll talk uh, a little bit about the causes and consequences of seizures in neonates. We'll review evidence leading to key International League Against Epilepsy guidelines for seizure diagnosis, management, and parent communication. And we'll also, if we have time at the end, talk a bit about risk factors for infantile spasms after neonatal seizures. But first, let's kind of set our brains to, to who we're thinking about here. 
Um, this is a, a young child, a 12 hours male uh, who was admitted from meconium aspiration and he started having these events, very subtle, um, but at the top of the screen, you can see that um, right arm making some very subtle clonic movements. You guys know, let me see, I'm just gonna see if I can remove this. Um, disable, fifth from the bottom, hide floating, thank you. Okay, there we go. Uh, There we go. Okay, so um, those left-sided seizures were in fact confirmed on EEG. The EEG background was normal between the seizures. The baby was treated with phenobarbital first 20, then 10 milligrams per kilo, and the seizure stopped within six hours. As some of you might have guessed, uh, the MRI confirmed a left MCA territory stroke. So why do I study seizures? What, what brings me to this, um, this clinical condition? Uh, and so I'll go through a few slides telling you why. So the first is just how very common they are. So this is seizure incidents across the lifespan. And as you can see, neonates are right up there at the highest, uh, highest incidence. And this is one to four per thousand live births. Also, seizures often reflect underlying brain injury. Here are some of the most common causes of seizures in newborns, starting at the left, HIE, with that basal ganglia injury that you can see there, stroke uh, here in the uh, left middle cerebral artery territory, the intracranial hemorrhage that shows up in that right temporal lobe, and then on the far uh, right is infection. This was a herpes encephalitis. And in fact, it turns out that about 70% of seizures in newborns are provoked by an acute brain injury. And we call those acute provoked or acute symptomatic seizures. And that's mostly what I'll be talking about today. Children with acute provoked seizures are also at high risk for adverse outcomes. These are uh, a, a case series from UCSF. Uh, more than a quarter died. 21% uh, had cerebral palsy. 13% had low Bailey cognitive scores and 9% had epilepsy. And as you can see in the Venn diagram, really importantly, many children having overlapping and multiple disabilities. We've also learned that there's probably something about newborn seizures that increase the risk of epilepsy. These are data from Kaiser Permanente, which is California's best way of, of doing population-based data. It's an insurance provider, but they keep really good longitudinal records. And this was led by Christine Fox at UCSF. Uh, and uh, what we did was look at all children with perinatal stroke divided by children with no seizure in the solid line and uh, light blue bar compared to children who presented with neonatal seizure in the green and dashed bar. And what you can see pretty clearly is that at all time points, children who presented with neonatal seizures had three times the risk of later epilepsy. We've been talking about uh, acute symptomatic or acute provoked seizures. Those are the ones on the left side here and in the blue bar, but it turns out that about 13% of neonates with seizures actually present with a neonatal onset epilepsy. And we'll talk just a little bit about that um, as well. So fairly rare, um, but, but an important subset. It turns out seizures in babies are really difficult to treat and study. So there's a handful of treatment trials. Um, I'll list them here. Many small observational studies. When we started our work uh, more than a decade ago, most of the studies were really small size or maybe had limited EEG available or were only single center. And so to overcome some of those barriers, I draw on um, what I'll tell you about today's three main sources of data. The first is our neurointensive care nursery, and we established that in 2008. And along with that uh, program establishment, we started doing continuous video EEG on all our babies at risk or with seizures. So we collected a lot of great data there. 
I also developed what we call the neonatal seizure registry. This started in 2012. Um, it started with a pediatric epilepsy Foundation, research foundation grant, which is a great, uh, great um, funding source for, for junior investigators. Um, and it's now nine centers, and I have highlighted here my co-PI, uh, Renee Shellhawk. The really neat thing about the neonatal seizure registry is that we have a uh, parent and stakeholder input, a parent from each study site, and representatives from parent advocacy organizations. And I'd, I'd love to talk about that if people have questions about how to integrate uh, stakeholders into research. This is just an overview of the studies that we've done in NSR. So I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the far left here, our first cohort of all comers of, of seizures. I, and then <clears throat> talk more about NSR2, which was um, a prospective enrollment of only children with acute provoked seizures. We're now into NSR Dev, which is following up to eight years, NSR Rise, which is collecting biomarkers, and NSR Gene, which is collecting uh, genetic data. And then finally, uh, the HEAL trial you might have heard of, uh, EPO for HIE in cooled babies led by Yvonne Wu and, and Sunny Jewell. Um, unfortunately, EPO didn't work, but we have a ton of amazing data that we can use um, to better understand these conditions. Okay, so the first um, section I'll talk about is EEG monitoring for seizure diagnosis. So we have a super sick kiddo here where he's intubated, he's got lines and, and tubes, and um, but is he having seizures and what's happening to the brain? So it turns out that clinical detection of seizures um, is really pretty bad. Um, and I should say most of today I'm focusing on my own data. It's what I know best. Um, but there are uh, uh, some of my colleagues, um, for example, here the Irish group from Cork um, also does outstanding work in neonatal seizures. And this was a, a, a fairly old study now. But basically, the study was they tell everyone at the bedside to mark down every time you see a neonatal seizure, you think the baby's having a seizure. It turns out that less than 30% of the electroclinical seizures were recognized and recorded by the medical or nursing staff. So there was pretty important underdiagnosis. Also 70%, more than 70% of the seizures that they documented in the notes had no correlating EEG signature. So there was also overdiagnosis at the same time. We also looked at this in our cohort. This was our first year data. So 32 babies with seizures, 66% didn't have seizures within the first 30 minutes and 84% had seizures for over a period longer than 30 minutes. So that routine short EEG really wasn't doing much to, um, to accurately um, characterize seizures. We also uh, then looked later on to up to a cohort of uh, 400 EEGs and found that 40% of those had findings that impact management. So 20% confirmed suspected seizures, 6% with EEG seizures never had a clinical correlate, they were only subclinical, and 13% uh, were normal in neonates with clinically suspected seizures. Now for our NSR data, this is our first cohort of 611 newborns, 62% had at least one EEG only seizure and 16% had only EEG seizures without clinical correlate. So what's the evidence here? Well, routine 30 minute EEG is going to miss seizures in babies, probably going to miss seizures in any ICU, but particularly with the babies, because it's so hard to recognize as I showed you in the video. You might not have seen that if you were even at the bedside paying close attention to this baby. And without EEG, we end up with underdiagnosis. So there's unrecognized electroclinical and subclinical seizure, seizures that would, just won't get treated. And on the flip side, there's overdiagnosis of non-seizure clinical events, and children might be subjected to unnecessary treatment with anti-seizure medication. So this now showing how some of this information uh, has made it into guidelines. This is the recent International League Against Epilepsy, Classification of Seizures and the Epilepsies of Modification for Seizures in Neonates. And this is a good read for anyone who's interested in baby seizures, but really what it does is emphasize the key role of EEG for diagnosis of seizures, 
And um, basically to get a seizure diagnosis, you really need a, a, a standard EEG correlate. You can get a probable diagnosis of seizures if there are seizures on amplitude integrated EEG or if they're focal clonic, like the baby we saw here, or focal tonic seizures. Um, but the rest, uh, you know, any other type of clinical seizure uh, is, is insufficient evidence or just a possible diagnosis. Okay, next I'll talk about seizure treatment and timing. Does it matter? So we know from observational data that there's a higher burden of that a higher burden of seizures translates to a higher risk of brain injury, disability, epilepsy, and even death. And these findings persist even after adjusting for any of the measurable factors that that we're able to adjust for. And some studies have shown that a total seizure time of over 40 minutes and a maximum seizure burden more than 13 minutes per hour are kind of dividing lines of, of what, what uh, puts a baby at highest risk. It's very hard to study this problem. There are two randomized controlled trials looking at treat the EEG versus blind the EEG at the bedside. So the image here is from the Dutch group. Um, there's also an American study. It turns out when you ask a parent to have an important diagnostic study blinded, they're not so keen to enroll their baby in a trial. So both of these trials closed um, just because they weren't getting enough babies. But what they found was that there was a lower seizure burden in the treated group and also that higher seizure burden was associated with worse MRI or worse Bailey scores. What they didn't do was be able to really compare between the two groups as you would do in a randomized controlled trial um, because of, of small treatment sizes. So I think it's gonna be really hard um, to answer this question. <clears throat> Folks have looked at um, timing of treatment. Uh, does it matter how fast we treat the baby? This is from the Irish group. Um, and what they found was actually the faster the child was treated, the, the, the lower the median seizure burden, and also the lower the number of seizures within 24 hours. And they have a pretty nice dose response curve of you know how fast, how fast you treat and faster is better. We tried to look at this in the neonatal seizure registry. This was led by my colleague, Courtney Wusthoff, and she took a bit of a different approach. She's looking now at treatment success or treatment response and divided the group into those who had a screening EEG so that were uh, monitored because of encephalopathy or risk of seizures compared to those who had a confirmatory EEG, so suspected seizures clinically and found that the screening EEG, there was a higher rate of treatment risk success, again, suggesting somehow that the EEG is on and we're, we're getting to those seizures faster. She then tried to explore this question in the HEAL data, um, and this is led again by Courtney Wusthoff and Adam Numis, um, and looked at three different ways of measuring um, treatment success, looking at time to treatment, total seizures before uh, treatment, and maximum hourly seizure burden. And I put the, the um, answer in the title. It turns out that you know time to treatment wasn't a factor in this group. In fact, those that were treated faster were less likely to respond. Um, and probably that has something to do with seizure burden, but we don't know. Uh, total seizure duration also wasn't significantly uh, different. Um, but this maximum hourly seizure burden um, was significant. So the higher the maximum hourly seizure burden, the more seizures a baby was having back to back, the less likely they were to respond to treatment. So what's the evidence here? As neurologists, we always say time is brain. Um, and here time is time seizing, uh, we think is brain. Um, so higher seizure burden, definitely associated with worse outcome. So it probably makes sense to treat seizures quickly and particularly before the neonate reaches a high maximum hourly seizure burden. But more studies are definitely needed to understand the association between treatment and outcome. 
This comes now from the treatment of seizures in the neonate guidelines and consensus-based recommendations for, again, from the International League Against Epilepsy, another really good read on a recent document. And here the consensus-based recommendations are that treating neonatal seizures, including EEG only, to achieve a lower seizure burden may be associated with improved outcomes. What are some of the things we've done and are doing to help reduce the time to treatment? These are uh, QI data from uh, my colleague, Katie Kramer, when she was a fellow. We looked at uh, implementation of a seizure RX button. So this was a, a, a hospital-wide uh, implementation of a button you could press to call pharmacy to the bedside anytime seizures are being treated in the ICU. It wasn't super well adopted in the nursery because the nurses felt like they were better. They know what to do. They know how to treat. They can go to the PIXIS. They can get it done. Um, but it turned out um, with education uh, and, and uh, some work to get them to use the seizure button uh, that uh, you can see here in the red line, um, the average time to seizure treatment fell below 15 minutes, which was, which was our goal. Whereas without using that seizure button, even though the nurses felt they were really good and they are really good, they're just not as fast folks, as when they use the seizure button. And then this is some work, um, uh, really uh, new and unpublished data um, from my colleague, Dan Bernardo. He's trying to look at, can we predict when a seizure will happen based on the EEG? And so he's doing some uh, modeling of EEG uh, recordings to see um, if, there's, if there's a way to predict um, with the idea that sometime in the future, we'll have some signal on the EEG at the bedside to say, oh, baby's about to start seizing soon. Okay, moving on to my third section. Um, gonna look at how long to treat acute provoked seizures. So this is um, this is really at the at the heart of something I'm very passionate about. Um, so these are data from the the HEAL trial showing the percentage of uh, seizures within the last hour. Um, and it turns out that acute provoked seizures, the ones we've been talking about, usually resolve within about 72 hours. This is cooling babies, so you see it like a teeny bump um, I, during the rewarming phase, but really mostly two to three, maybe sometimes four days, and the seizures usually resolve. But it's not clear how long to treat them. So there's kind of two main approaches. One is the maintain approach, and that's where the meds are weaned. Uh, and usually it's phenobarbital at, at follow up with neurology, which is maybe three to six months of age. It is a historical approach. It was developed before we had uh, continuous video EEG to see the seizures develop and resolve. Um, and it's also an approach that, that started before we had MRI to know exactly the diagnosis and cause of seizures, and before there was genetic testing to know if maybe the baby had a genetic epilepsy. Um, but increasingly, there's concerns about prolonged phenobarbital use. Do we really need that much medicine for these babies? So more recently, in the last couple decades, there's been an approach to discontinue anti-seizure medicines, and that's to stop the meds after resolution of acute seizures. And this was shown safe in many small studies, um, but a randomized controlled trial failed due to low enrollment. And when we looked at our preliminary data, it turned out about three quarters were in the maintain group and one quarter in the discontinue. Um, and but what was the, what was the difference? Why were some maintained and some continued? Well, there were some things like seizure burden and and um, type of injury, but really the best predictor was study center. Um, and I showed you the center. So for those of you who aren't familiar, they're all large quaternary care. We've got CHOP, we've got UCSF, we've got Boston Children's. Um, but this range of how they dealt with this similar medical condition was very different. So 4% were maintained at one site and 91% were maintained on meds at another site. So seeing this, we had a failed trial, but we have this great practice variability. We wanted to take advantage of that to try to answer the question. We started with the hypothesis that there was no harmful effect of early medication discontinuation. And this came from the preliminary data that I mentioned. 
So we did a comparative effectiveness study. So this is where children were prospectively enrolled at nine sites across the US. Again, we're all level four NICU, level four pediatric epilepsy, and all the sites follow ACNS guidelines for neonatal EEG. And that's really um, continuous video EEG monitoring in all children at risk for seizures and until at least 24 hours after the last seizure. We included any seizure onset less than 44 weeks postmenstrual age and any cause of acute provoked seizures. And again, these are the most common, HIE, ischemic strokes, and intracranial hemorrhages. We excluded any transient causes, so uh, hypo, uh, hyponatremia, for example, we excluded clinical events that were determined not to be seizures. We also excluded early onset epilepsies. I'll talk a bit more about that. And then obviously babies that didn't survive the neonatal admission. Our primary predictor was anti-seizure medications discontinued before discharge from the neonatal stay compared with those who are maintained at the time of discharge. We use the WIDEA as our outcome. Um, this actually turns into an interesting story. This was um, a telephone questionnaire and we had really amazing follow-up. Of course, years later, the pandemic came and we realized like the more we can do telephone or online follow-up developmental assessments, really the better um, the better uh, our outcomes and, and rates of follow-up we're gonna get and also probably better for equity. Um, but so we, 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 this is what we use. We also looked at epilepsy. Um, our analysis, this is important, was by propensity score. It's a tool that is used to reduce bias due to confounding. Because you're going to say, well, of course, the babies that were sicker got, were more likely to be on meds and also more likely to develop epilepsy. So this is a statistical matching technique that uses observational data. So again, you can't, you can't know causality from observation. You need a randomized trial to know definitely that there's causation. But this helps estimate treatment effect by accounting for all those covariates that are gonna predict the treatment. And it's used to help improve causal inference in non-randomized trials. And this is what it looks like. You have a population with varying characteristics. And um, we'll imagine here that the blue group stayed on meds and the, the light blue group uh, came off meds. What you do is you match by clinical characteristics and then compare within uh, a group to see how those children did. And for our study, we matched by quintiles and we powered for non-inferiority. So what our parent partners and stakeholders said um, that it was important that if we're going to stop medicine, that the kids don't do somehow do worse than if they stayed on medicine. So we added into the propensity model, gestational age, worst EEG background, days of EEG seizures, hypothermia, discharge exam, and cause of seizures. And what, uh, what we turned out was that 64% were maintained, so a little less than our preliminary data, um, but this was mostly phenobarbital monotherapy, a few kids on Keppra, and then uh, some on polytherapy, but always included phenobarbital. And essentially, we found no harmful effect of early discontinuation of medication. These are the WIDEA scores in both the maintained in purple and the discontinued in gray. And in every case, the discontinued did just a little bit better. Um, and then even after adjusting for those propensity uh, scores. We also looked at age of epilepsy onset, which was again, similar between the groups. Um, and importantly and interestingly, uh, all the kids that had early onset, like less than four months, that time zone where you're thinking about stopping medicine, those were all the kids that were in the maintained group. So staying on medicine hadn't prevented um, their epilepsy, and a third of those kiddos had, had spasms. So what's the evidence? Um, we feel like this is pretty compelling evidence to stop anti-seizure medicine after resolution of acute provoked seizures. And really what it boils down to is there's not a great rationale for continuing the anti-seizure maintenance. So there's no benefit on developmental outcome. We showed that pretty clearly. 
It prolongs exposure to potentially harmful medications. It doesn't delay the onset of epilepsy and the earliest onset epilepsies occur in spite of seizure maintenance. And then finally, a third of those early epilepsies are infantile spasms. And we know phenobarb, Keprod, these are not first line spasm medications. Um, so we're not, we're not helping those kids um, by continuing medicine. We're extremely proud that this has made it into the ILA task force. Again, this is the seizure treatment recommendations guideline um, that says following cessation of acute provoked seizures without evidence for neonatal onset epilepsy, ASMs should be discontinued before discharge, regardless of EEG or uh, MRI findings. But wait a minute, we just said, what about epilepsy? This is a worry. So we think to ourselves, is it safe to stop anti-seizure medications? Well, have the seizure stopped on EEG for at least 24 hours? Is the cause of seizures acute provoked? Because epilepsy is a different thing that it's gonna need a different treatment. And have the parents been counseled about what to do in case of seizures? The answer is yes to all three. It's safe to stop the anti-seizure medicine. But could it be epilepsy? So this is for those of you who spend time at the bedside with babies. Think to yourself, are there red flags? First of all, is the birth history fairly unremarkable? Could be a red flag. Seizures lasting for more than four days. Again, remember, they mostly resolve within three to four days. If that MRI is normal or if it has a brain malformation causing that could cause an epilepsy. And if the semiology is tonic or myoclonic, these are red flags. Um, and these are the data showing semiology. Uh, just to show you quickly, HIE and stroke, the acute provoked causes on the top have clonic and electrographic only seizures, whereas the channelopathy and this genetic mutation on the bottom have tonic and myoclonic seizures. These are data um, by Marie Cornette at UCSF uh, when she was a fellow. So looking at just quickly at epilepsies in babies. So this is, again, from the ILA classification and definition of epilepsy syndrome. And I'm focusing here just on the, on the parts of the box that, that deal with neonates. Um, on the left, we have the self-limited epilepsies. These used to be called something like benign neonatal, benign neonatal familial. Now we call them self-limited neonatal epilepsy or self-limited neonatal self-limited familial neonatal infantile, so selny and selfny. Um, and in the self-limited onset, it's usually a few days after birth, seizures are focal tonic or clonic. Seizures usually remit in the first six months and milestones are usually normal. On the other side, we have the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. You, these used to go by names like Odahara or early myoclonic epilepsy. Here the onset's less than three months, the seizures are often drug resistant, the exam's abnormal, and the kids have moderate to profound developmental impairment. And just to show you a bit what they look like, this baby on the left had tonic seizures, the exam was normal, baby was taking good oral feeds, and when grandma come, came to the nursery, she said, oh yeah, the dad actually had something that looked exactly like this when he was a baby. Um, and this EEG background is, is perfectly normal. Similar story on the right, tonic seizures. Seizures looked exactly the same, but the EEG background is very suppressed. Baby was low tone and encephalopathic, needing NG feeds and no family history. Well, we know now these are both uh, uh, presentations of KCNQ2, uh, neonatal onset epilepsy on the left, self-limited, and on the right, a developmental epileptic encephalopathy. And both of these babies are going to respond to sodium channel blockers like oxcarbazepine. And um, just to highlight um, this real revolution we've had in the last uh, decade or so, these data are, are, are even a little old now from our first cohort in the neonatal seizure registry. Among those with no uh, acute cause, 68% of those who were tested had an identified genetic mutation. Um, KCNQ2 being the most obvious, but for those of you who do um, later childhood epilepsy, some of that alphabet is very familiar, SCN1A, KCNT1, et cetera. 
So um, infantile epilepsy panel or whole exome sequencing is really becomes now a first line test with treatment implications that should be done as soon as an epilepsy is suspected, even in, even in the nursery. Okay, my last um, uh, evidence section is coming um, from parent communication. Um, as we all know, family well-being is really a key for child development. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time thinking about parent communication for children in the nursery, um, children with bad neurological injuries. We know there's not a lot of medicines or treatments um, but being able to communicate with the family, I think is really important. It's probably one of the most important things we can do for those families. Um, these are data led uh, by Linda Frank in our group, looking at parent well-being at discharge and then longitudinally. And it turns out that symptoms of anxiety, depression, and PTSD are really, really high in these kiddos. Again, these are all parents of children with neonatal seizures. Um, and those rates dim diminish over time, um, but they remain really important. And it's something important for us to know about when we're talking with families at the bedside and, and at follow up. My colleague, Monica Lemon, wanted to look at the parent experience of caring for a ne neonate with seizures. What was it like at the bedside? And she found four uh, important themes. Um, sources of strength, this is really important. This is something we can do to our families to give them strength. That is medical team consensus and opportunities to contribute to care and that can help with bonding with the infant. There's lots of more negative themes. So uncertainty, daily uncertainty of ICU, uncertainty of the team's future. Here it shows up again, lack of team consensus, kind of feeding that uncertainty. Um, and then adapting to family life. And we've talked about the emotional and physical toll. So what's the evidence? It, we need to care for the child and the parents when we're at the bedside. Parents of children with seizures have really high rates of anxiety and depression. And to support parents, it's actually pretty easy, the things we can do. We can provide clear and consistent communication. We need to have consensus within the team. And we need to encourage parent participation in bedside care. And um, on the right side of the screen here, this is a little infographic that we made along with our parent uh, partners and stakeholders. And uh, this is uh, something for, for the medical team and you can find it on our website. If you want. This has also made it into the treatment of seizures in the neonate. Um, Consensus-based consideration is that parents of a neonate with seizures should be informed, uh, informed about possible etiologies and treatment options, as well as subsequent discussions based on the neonate's condition. So recognition that that communication piece is really important. Okay, I'm going to spend the last couple minutes um, talking about infantile spasms, and then we'll we'll have some time for questions. Um, so everyone likes videos. So I have a few videos here of um, kiddos with infantile spasms. So as you know, it's a severe onset epilepsy. Can be missed and hard to diagnose. Here's another one. This poor little guy loses his passy every time he has a spasm. And one more. Okay, so looking at infantile spasms, now we're, we're looking at the International League Against Epilepsy classification and definition. Before we had just the, the top of the two talk boxes for babies, now we have the full box for each, um, for babies and infants, neonates and infants, and infantile spasm syndrome falls under the developmental epileptic encephalopathies. 
And as um, most of you know, uh, this is three diagnostic criteria, seizures. Um, and we saw a good mix of those in the videos. They could be flexor, extensor, or mixed, and they often occur in, cl in clusters. The interictal EEG is hypsarrhythmia or multifocal or focal epileptiform discharges. And age of onset by definition for infantile spasms is less than 24 months, but almost all of them uh, happen by, by 12 months, usually around six months. Infantile spasms after acute provoked seizures, it was actually quite rare in our data, it represented 4% of the neonatal seizure registry cohort, but a third of the children who developed epilepsy before uh, two years. Um, it's rare individually, but it turns out acute, uh, acute provoked causes uh, account for about 25% of all causes of infantile spasms. So these are data from China. Half remain unknown, but but next after that, acute structural causes are the um, second, the first identified cause. So so rare but important. Uh, why is it important to recognize spasms as soon as possible? These are infants enrolled in the UKIS study, and what they found is the faster the kids were treated, the better they did on their violent score. So you want to treat, you want to recognize, and adequately treat as quickly as possible. So we thought, well, wouldn't it be great to know which kids are at the highest risk um, of developing infantile spasms so we can counsel and, and we can keep a close eye on them? Um, and so for this, we, we looked at seven sites and we looked at potential predictors like EEG, MRI, and clinical factors. And then uh, we developed some models uh, to help answer that question. And we found three key risk factors. The first was a severely abnormal EEG or three or more days with EEG seizures. The second was deep gray or brainstem injury. And the third was abnormal tone on discharge exam. And it turns out in our data set, if you had none of the risk factors, uh, none of those children developed infantile spasms. One or two was about the baseline rate of spasms, 4%. But children with all three risk factors had more than a 50% chance of developing infantile spasms. So what's the evidence? Infantile spasms can probably be predicted based on clinical factors. And how does this uh, help our families? Um, well, it can be great for parent education and follow-up. So children with no risk factors, we can, we can reassure and maybe be a little more hands-off. But children with all three risk factors, they require careful monitoring, education, and a very low threshold for EEG. Um, and we like the Child Neurology Foundation uh, uses the STOP mnemonic to uh, so see the signs, take a video, obtain a diagnosis, and prioritize treatment. Um, this hasn't made it into guidelines yet. We're um, working uh, with Zach Grinspan, who is a part of this prior study, to now do a prospective electronic medical record study at, at a large number of sites across the U.S. to try to validate these data. But we did make some uh, more infographics, uh, again, available on our website. So back to our case, uh, the child was uh, diagnosed with definite seizures based on the EEG. So this is a little guy who had the, those subtle clonic movements. Seizures were treated rapidly. Decision was made to discontinue anti-seizure medicines after 48 hours with no seizures. There was a family meeting to discuss the cause of seizures, clinical course, and plans for follow-up. And family was counseled about the low risk of infantile spasms. I'll end by acknowledging all my, uh, all my many, many collaborators and funding sources. Uh, I'll give a quick plug for the Newborn Brain Society. So for anyone who isn't uh, familiar with this, uh, it's 100% free for trainees and very reasonably priced for, for the rest of us. Lots of really good online educational resources and weekly seminars. So please do, do check them out. And uh, a meeting upcoming in Cork, Ireland for anyone who can go uh, happening next month. And I'll end there with just a few minutes for questions. And thank you all for being such a great audience uh, online and in the room. Okay. Here, uh, stop sharing.
just while I'm doing this, any questions for here in the audience uh, live, and then we can open up to everyone else. And we often we say, well, select your acoustical. Mm -hmm. And I, I can never come with a definite, well, base certain social relation. Therefore, it is not a negative nature. Yeah. Is there like a like a reference or like a, a can I just repeat the question? Yeah. I'm just going to repeat the question, so I'll do it. There's I'm just repeating the questions from Dr. Sell uh, for, for Dr. Glass. The question is, sometimes in neonates, we see things that really look like seizures, bicycling movements, other movements. We have an EEG to show Hannah probably later on today of a patient we have right now in the hospital. And But the EEG does not show what we would consider a seizure pattern. Was that what you're saying, Eric? So how do we address those, uh, Dr. Glass? Because we don't know what we're treating or 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 why we're treating. Other questions uh, for here? Okay, so why don't we go for Lauren and then Katie? Oh, <laughs> sure. So the question is about um, our EEG monitoring practices and what to do if you don't have EEG. Um, so we do, we, we monitor everyone for all of cooling and rewarming. Um, so it's a big challenge. Um, not everyone has the resources. Um, one thing that, that we do that is partly a workaround that could maybe be available with some, some fighting with your center is to have your own EEG machines that belong to the unit and then to put on a modified montage when the baby comes in. So an amplitude integrated EEG. We use um, the same machine, same head box to put on the modified montage if the if the tech isn't available. And then when the tech comes, they'll re they'll apply the full montage around the amplitude integrated. And then we display amplitude integrated at the bedside um, for all babies that are, are on monitor so that the bedside team has something has something to look at. Um, and um, we like using the same machine because then you're you're using the same tool, all the markings that the nurse does, all the markings that neurophys does, they're it's like they're talking to each other. Um, but what do you do if you don't have monitoring? You can just do your best. You know, if it's focal hemiclonic, probably it's a seizure you go ahead and treat. Um, if it's not, uh, if it's not stereotyped or not focal clonic or focal tonic, then probably you watch. Um, and I think the important thing, like, again, this is where we get to that three to six months of treatment. Like, so what you gave phenobarb once and it, like the baby didn't really need it. For me, the key is that then you do get the EEG on at some point and you do that monitoring for, you know, however long your center is able to. But if you monitor for a good period of time after and the baby's not having seizures, then sure, you've maybe given them a couple of days of meds that they didn't need, but at least now you're stopping it before they go home. So rather than three months or six months of unnecessary meds, you've only given them a few days, which is just the limitation of, of what your center is able to do. So does that help? Okay. Um, I 
Yeah, it's a really good question. So the questions about surveillance EEG for infantile spasms and high risk. It's the, the next study, one of the next studies we want to do. So we know obviously in tuberous sclerosis, there's been a lot of work in this area doing surveillance EEG and, and treatment. Um, we don't have good evidence. Um, so yeah, so there's there's no evidence available. We do, you know, a lot of these kids are very brain injured and are still in our units at three months or so. So we've started saying like, hey, let's check an EEG at three or four months in these babies since they're they're still in our hands. Um, but I think it's a good question. Um, I don't think it's, it wouldn't be wrong to to do it. So the question of the three month follow up EEG. So we we did actually look at that. Um, and really, it's not helpful for predicting future epilepsy. So in your average child at low risk, there's probably no, no benefit to just doing a spot EEG. I think it used to, historically, it was like to decide whether or not to stop the medicine, which doesn't, it, anyway, it doesn't, it didn't make great sense of why to do it in the first place. And it turns out that it not super predictive of later epilepsy, better just to wait and watch to see if the child develops it. But I do think there's probably a subset and probably those kids with that are at high risk for infantile spasms where it does actually make sense to do it. We just don't have good evidence yet. So, um, yeah. Uh, we'll open it up to the virtual audience. There may be something in the chat. We'll try and figure this out, the chat. Okay, uh, here's a question for you, uh, Hannah says it was amazing to see the development of a research uh, uh, with suggestion of research questions regarding genome testing, genomic testing, who pays for it, I mm. think is the question, or have you figured out a way to get it covered? And of course, mm. the, the US is different. But. I try to stay as far away from uh, insurance policies and testing as possible. Um, I, so we are now able to get whole exome from the nursery or panels. Um, we, I think the evidence is quite good or very reasonable that it will affect management. Um, so that helps us when getting insurance to pay. I think we also have various buckets of money from which to, to, to be able to pay for studies, but I don't know. I don't know the details for logistics. Um, I, I guess the, the best, um, approach would be to work um, yeah, work with the government to convince them that, that it's going to change practice management. You're going to tailor, for epilepsy, it's very clear that you need to tailor your medicine to the epilepsy diagnosis. It's So for babies, phenobarbine, but for babies with epilepsy, there is tailored treatments. And so that's a management change that will happen in the nursery. The other argument is like all the stuff we used to do when I was a resident, we remember LPs for neurotransmitters and all these metabolic crazy giant workups that were you know useless because the baby had KCNT2 <laughs> epilepsy. Um, so that's more expensive than just running a whole genome, which is, you know, the prices have come quite far down. So um, um, advocacy, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> Okay, well, it looks like we're at uh, time here. So I just want to thank Dr. Glass very much. It was an amazing presentation. And thanks everyone for attending both in person and virtually. And like I said, will there be a break now for half an hour? Then we'll resume with some trainee talks. And like we said in the afternoon, for all the trainees at CHEO, there'll be some neonatal uh, neurology cases. Okay, thanks again. Thank, thank you. you.